Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, October 30th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Denver, Colorado. PowerShell is not just a great tool for Windows system administrators, but of course, malware authors also have discovered how useful it is and how it can be abused. So then again, to fight this trend, we have a lot of tools that try to monitor what PowerShell is doing. It appears that some malware authors are now again trying to counter these countermeasures. And in one example that DDA has looked at, it looks like that one way they're trying to actually accomplish this is by just creating a renamed copy of PowerShell. So in this example, they used a Visual Basic macro in order to copy the complete PowerShell folder. That way they can rename PowerShell and then they are not no longer calling PowerShell itself, but instead a random named binary that it turns out to be this copy of PowerShell. As the DA points out, it's actually a little bit questionable how effective this strategy is. Since this is still the original legitimate PowerShell binary, it will create all the usual log events and such that you're used to from PowerShell. So as a result, well, it may actually send the same alerts or trigger the same alerts that the original copy would have sent. The other part to this is if uh, someone sees PowerShell running, they may actually be not really all that suspicious, but if they're pulling up their process explorer and they're seeing this random string of letters instead of PowerShell, this may actually raise more alerts, not less. So not sure how useful this technique is, but certainly something to look out for if you all of a sudden see a copy of PowerShell running under a different name. And talking about malicious documents, one thing that we have talked in our diaries a few times was unusual and different file types being used in order to deliver malware. Trend Micro now has a nice blog post summarizing some of the newer file types that they are seeing. Now, these aren't really new file types, but they haven't really been used for malicious documents in the past, and they're a little bit more exotic. So. Really, the hope here of the attacker is to bypass some simple blacklists that will not accept some of the more common file types like Word documents and such that are often used in malware. Some of these files are really just compressed files like .c and .arj, just a little bit unusual compression systems that are being used here. Also publisher files and IQY files that are being used in some of the attacks that Trend Micro observed. Many of these attacks still rely on the good old techniques that we're used to from the more common file formats, so still expect office macros, PowerShell scripts, and the usual as payload. And CoinTicker is an apparently somewhat popular application for Mac OS that allows you to keep track of cryptocurrency prices. However, it appears that this application does more than just follow the crypto coin markets. Instead, it will also install a backdoor. The backdoor is fairly basic, rudimentary. One, actually two backdoors are being installed. One of them is the good old eggshell backdoor. So so nothing really all that special, but well, uh, if the user installs it for you, you don't really have to be all that fancy. The backdoors are actually downloaded after the initial software is installed, so the attacker could easily swap this out for something else down the road. And Microsoft now enabled Windows Defender to run inside a sandbox. Now, sandboxes, of course, are a big topic in recent years. More and more operating systems are enforcing them and are recommending that developers run software inside sandboxes. But in particular, anti-malware has been problematic when it comes to sandboxes because, well, to do their job, they really need to be able to read arbitrary files on the file system 
they need to be able to inspect inputs and outputs and hook themselves into some system processes. But because there were also a number of vulnerabilities in anti-malware software in particular, in Windows Defender, Microsoft decided to actually take a stab at running Windows Defender inside a sandbox. The way they accomplished this is by really running only some key components that they consider the most susceptible to exploitation inside the sandbox, while then provide other components that allow this sandbox to do what it needs to do and to access the system resources that anti-malware needs to access. It's optional for now, so it's not enabled by default as far as I can tell, but Microsoft's blog does tell you what the switch is in order to enable this feature. Well, that is it for today, so thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.